All right, I want to take a moment to welcome Jen Glantz to our show. Now, Jen's an interesting woman slash entrepreneur. She's She's been all over the place. So she is the mastermind behind the website Bridesmaid for Hire, where she essentially well, how about I let you describe it, Jen, because I you're going to do it way more just. I'll probably just butcher the entire idea, but you, you go ahead and describe it. Well, thank you so much, Chris, for having me on the show today. I am so excited to be on. I am the founder of Bridesmaid for Hire. So yes, I am a hired bridesmaid by strangers all over the country. <laughs> I started the business two years ago, and I have a couple different packages, but essentially I like to say I'm the on-call therapist, the personal assistant, the social director and the peacekeeper for brides to be. Now, let me ask you, how long have you been doing the bridesmaids for hire, I guess, business as a whole? So I started it two years ago. Uh, I was a bridesmaid for my friends so many times when I was in my early 20s. And uh, there was one night in particular where my roommate looked at me and she called me the professional bridesmaid. So that's kind of when I decided, you know what, I'm going to try to make a career out of this. And it's been about two and a half years. Yeah, and we were talking before we actually started recording, and I asked you, well, how many of these have you actually done? And you told me you've done over 40. So you... No, let me ask, you've been, have you ever been the maid of honor at a wedding? I have. There's been quite a really? few times where I've given speeches and I have <laughs> been not only the maid of honor, but also their only bridesmaid. Really? Only, is it like a small type of wedding when you're the only bridesmaid? Yeah, you know, there's sometimes when brides don't have many close friends or when the mm. wedding's not as big as other weddings might be where they just want, you know, one person to be by their side. Now, if you're listening to this and you're sitting here and wondering, well, I'm going through a breakup. How does this even apply to me? Well, I brought Jen on the show because I think she has a really unique perspective to offer, especially when it comes to falling in love. And you have been present at 40 different weddings, and arguably that is the most uh, romantic thing that a couple can do is get married, right? So you, you are essentially watching it all happen. And so I wanted to bring Jen onto the show to talk a little bit about her perspective and what maybe she has seen as an objective viewer and what makes love work. But before we get to that, I have to definitely quiz you on some of the burning questions in my mind, specifically yes. relating to the, the bridesmaids, uh, I guess job as a whole. So you've been to 40 weddings. What would you say is like the weirdest experience you've had at a wedding? Oh man, you know, I've had some some very weird experiences, uh, you know, just off the top of my head. Uh, there was one wedding where I had to, uh, I had to, um, I worked an outdoor wedding in Nevada and there was animal droppings down the aisle and uh, the bride was about to walk down the aisle and <laughs> oh, get her no. dress ruined. So I Don't had tell a me. job. You didn't. Oh yes. You, oh, I you did. You didn't. Oh. I did. You can finish that sentence of how that went, but yeah. I took care of business. Uh, so, you know, while the job <laughs> Job sounds glamorous. Uh, it's anything but, and you're you're often doing things that nobody else will do. Yeah, picking up animal droppings is definitely not in the job. I hope you got paid well for that one. Oh yeah, but you know what? Can you really pay someone enough for that job? No, so, no, no. That's, that's that that memory. that. Who knew? You know, they have that that what was it? Dirty jobs. You know, it was yeah. like on TV. You are essentially you're the next one in a bridesmaid. Like it's a dirty job. It is. You don't you don't realize it. I mean, a lot of what I do is help the bride in, in uncomfortable situations. Uh, you know, people don't talk about this, but peeing in a wedding dress is really, really, really hard. So one of the main things I help brides do is go to the bathroom in their wedding dress. I teach them how to pee in it. So, uh, you know, those are some of the grosser things that I do <laughs> at weddings, but um, I've seen it all and I really have done it all. So you, you've been a maid of honor at a few let's say a handful of weddings because I'm assuming most of the weddings you've you've actually been hired to become a bridesmaid at you haven't been the maid of honor you've probably just been like one of the bridesmaids right sure yeah there were times when I was just part of the bridal party and then there were definitely times when I was the maid of honor okay so as a maid of honor especially since if someone's hiring you to become a maid of honor it's not like you've probably gotten to know each other maybe a month or two before the wedding right yeah, sometimes we work together, you know, for a bit longer, we'll work together anywhere between 11 months to a year before the wedding. But yeah, there are cases when they hire me three months, two months before the wedding, and we kind of have to get get to know each other on a very, you know, fast basis. 
Okay, so it, it, it's a fast, I, I guess it's a trial by fire type thing where you, you're stuck in the hornet's nest. You you kind of have to fend for yourself. So obviously, one of the big things that a maid of honor has to do is give a speech. And you've said you've given multiple speeches before. So how do you structure the speech? That is such a great question. You know, one wedding in particular, I remember the bride told me I didn't have to give a speech. So sat back, was relaxing for a minute, and all of a sudden the DJ came up to me and announced that I was next to give a speech. So <laughs> I had to grab the mic and get up there and, and truly speak from the heart for a bride that I had never met before until that day. So, uh, you know, what I like to do is just really talk about what I learned about love through that person, which could sound silly because you don't really know the person, but you do. You get to see how they they feel around their person that they're marrying. And, you know, as a single girl at a lot of these weddings, I learned a lot of about love through these people that I, I didn't learn anywhere else. So I pull a lot of that into these speeches. Well, perfect. It, it basically doing my job for me. Perfect segue. So what have you been able to learn as an objective viewer of 40 different couples on the happiest day of their lives. So what is making their relationship work up until that point? What have you been able to learn? It's so interesting because I think before I worked weddings and I went to weddings all the time, I guess I thought love and relationships were supposed to be perfect. They were mm -hmm. supposed to be fairy tales. You wanted a person who met all this criteria. You have that Disney you to blame for that. <laughs> yeah. And, and you know what? You just have people to blame for it because yeah, nobody really tells you that relationships are extremely hard. They're ugly. They're hard. They're anything but perfect most of the time. And, you know, I have to be honest, some of the weddings I work, people don't get married for, for love. They get married for other reasons sometimes, which was crazy to see. And, you know, some people marry the wrong person and they know that before they do it, which I see often too. And, you know, there are occasional weddings where the couple just just fits really well and those are the ones I cling on to and those are the ones I take notes about because that really made me realize that I'm looking for the wrong person I'm dating the wrong people and it's about time that I start to, to look for the right things which isn't perfection which is just someone who puts up with you and you put up with them so you you said you're dating for the wrong reasons and you've been able to learn from your experience as a bridesmaid what are some of the other things you've been able to pick up on other than the fact that human beings aren't perfect i think that i realized that uh you know it's it's easy to rush into relationships i think that in my case all my friends got engaged and married by 24, 25, and I was still figuring out my life and my career and dating the very wrong people back then. And uh, I, I think I realized that it's not a race to the finish line, but oftentimes we feel pressure that it is. When everyone around us is, is finding what seems like the right person and getting married, we start to question, you know, what's wrong with us? Why are we still single? And one thing I learned is it's not a race. The last thing you want to happen is to show up on your wedding day and say to yourself, oh my God, I'm about to marry the wrong person. And as the bridesmaid for hire in a lot of these situations, I'm the one they tell that to. So I've seen so a couple times that brides have turned to me and said, I don't want to do this. I don't really like this person. I don't love this really? person. And and that's a strange thing to hear someone say on their wedding day, yet it's very common. Yeah, I guess it's a whole cold feet type of type of a, a thing people are dealing with. Now, uh, has anyone, so you, you've been at 40 weddings, you, you've, you're at the wedding and the bride turns to you and says, I don't want to do this. What do you do in that circumstance? Do you basically try to talk her into getting married to a guy she doesn't want to get married to? Or is it just try to end the wedding have you ha, what, what's the protocol there bridesmaid so I, yeah <laughs> i had a situation a couple months ago where five minutes before the ceremony started the bride pulled me aside and she said jen i don't like him i hate him oh, i don't want to get that's married horrible to hear it is. And, and, you know, my whole body was tingling, but also I can't say that was the first time it's happened. So I pulled her aside. I said, listen, you know, you don't have to do this. Uh, you know, her maid of honor wanted her to go through with it. Everyone wanted to, her to go through with it. But I looked her in the eye and said, listen, if you don't want to, we'll leave. I'll take you to dinner. You know, you don't have to do this. And I told her that. And then I said, but here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to put you in a room with the groom for 10 minutes. Talk to him. If after 10 minutes you still don't want to do it, I'll get us an Uber. We'll leave. So she did that and she walked out and said, I don't want to marry him. Uh, I don't love him. But you know what? I'm going to go through with a day because 
all of her guests were waiting for her to come out. So she did go through with it, and it was hard to watch. But, you know, it's not too late for her to end it after that. And I think that, uh, you know, people think when they, they walk down the aisle, it's a it's a done deal. But if you're having those second thoughts, if you don't want to do it, you know, it doesn't have to last forever just because you think you found the right person and they turn out to be wrong. So she, just so I have this straight, she went through with the wedding, but she, I, I guess she had plans to annul the marriage afterwards. Was that kind of the plan? I, I think so. You know, um, right from the looks of it, she was pretty angry at, you know, and or just, the thing about weddings no one tells you about either is that everything comes out you know all the drama all the the problems you have in your relationship they all come out to play on the wedding day because it's a very stressful situation so I think everything came to a head in that moment and Mm -hmm. I think she said to herself you know what you know I have 300 people waiting for me to walk down the aisle they traveled from all over the place I'm gonna do that but uh you know it was a very awkward wedding they barely danced together they barely talked to each other uh it, it was very hard to watch but I understand her decision and I'm not there to judge but uh, I'm definitely there to tell her that if she wants to run away I'll be the the getaway driver it's interesting I I, I think personally you did do the right thing Uh, I I can understand though that's a that's a difficult thing to watch someone go through and it's a little awkward and I suppose the only reason she walked down the aisle is probably to uh, appease all of the people who because weddings are a big deal now i remember my wedding we didn't want to have one of the big church weddings we wanted a simple wedding on the beach with with just small you know close friends and family but even then there was a fair share of drama so i imagine what are so give me the dirt here jen what what are some of the best drama stories you have because that one set the bar pretty high so let's can you break that one Oh my goodness, of course. You know, there's, there's always <laughs> drama attached to every wedding. And uh, it's funny that you mentioned your drama at yours because that's normal, but people don't really talk about it. Uh, I've had mothers of the bride try to sabotage the wedding. I had uh. one mother of the bride once who brought her own boxes of decorations uh, that the bride told her she didn't want to have there. And right before the reception, the mom was opening these boxes and putting these decorations all over the place, which were hideous and upsetting to the bride. So, uh, you know, my job was to secretly collect them and put Uh. them back in the box (laughs) so that the the bride didn't see. Um, You know, sometimes you have bridesmaids who are sabotaging the wedding day. They just don't listen to the bride and they just make it very much about them and there's drama with that uh you know the thing about weddings too is it's the only time in your life you know one of the only times when you have everybody you know in the same room and there's a reason that doesn't happen more often because (laughs) people don't get along all the time and uh you see that a lot you really do wow wow so you see a lot of i guess if you could pinpoint one person you you talked a lot about the mother of the bride but Is there one person in particular out of the 40 weddings you've been to that causes the most drama? To be honest, I would say it's the bride. And Mm. I say that only because, (laughs) yeah, and, you know, I don't blame anyone who's a bridezilla because here's what happens. You know, there's so much stress stress and pressure that's put on the bride for the wedding day that, you know, what ends up going on is that they just kind of lose it because they're so overwhelmed. So they sabotage their own weddings. They don't enjoy a second of it because they're walking around figuring out what's wrong, how to fix it. uh, And they're, they're just, you know, perfectionists because they're spending so much money on eight hours So uh, I see that a lot. I see a lot of brides who are just tiptoeing around their own wedding in a daze because they can't enjoy it. And so what are some of the tips and tricks you give them to maybe slow down and try to enjoy the day? Or do you just try to let them go through their own process? I really try to step in and intervene just because, you know, I've, I've been to so many weddings and I want, and I see this all the time. So there are many points when I just ask them to just slow down, take a deep breath. And, you know, I'm, I'm very honest. So I, I think that's why a lot of brides like working with me is because one thing I always tell them is, listen, your day is not going to go perfect. You know, understand that right now, get that out of the yeah. way that things are going to go wrong. So when things do go wrong, how are you going to react? How are you going to handle it? Let's plan that out now. You know, are you going to want to go to the bathroom and cry? for 10 minutes and then move on fine but you know let's have a a plan when things do go wrong because they absolutely will and so uh, 
you're 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 the bridesmaid. Now, do you ever have any input into what maybe the wedding planner does? Have you ever been hired for those skills because you've been to so many weddings, or is this strictly you're just there for the bride? Yeah, you know, I, I say that the wedding planner, that's a tough job in itself. And, and they really have a lot of work on their hands. But, you know, they're focusing on the venue and handling the vendors. My job is really to be there for the people to be there for the bride, the bridesmaids, all that wonderful stuff. Uh, I do a little bit of day of coordinating on the site as well. So if a bride needs a person there behind the scenes on her wedding, just making sure everything's running smoothly. I offer a package like that, too. But, you know, having a wedding planner, that's a whole other beast. You know, that's someone who's making sure everything is put together well and comes together well. And uh, that's not something that I ever really wanted to get into. So I leave that to the pros. <laughs> so it, it's a sound idea because I remember for my wedding, um, I, I'm kind of a laid back person. So I was always under the assumption that women loved planning these kind of things. <laughs> and so I gave the reins to my wife and obviously um, she wanted one thing and then her parents wanted another thing. And then it was a month before the wedding and nothing was getting done. And so I said, well, do you want me to just take over? And she was like, God, yes. And so I took over trying to coordinate things and I have never been more stressed on anything in my entire life before. Oh yeah. It, it's a stressful experience doing that. So I can't even imagine how you stay sane, especially when you're so tied you're, you're tied so closely to the bride. Yeah, you know, you're the one that is uh, dealing with every single emotion, the good, the bad, the ugly. And, you know, my job is to help them manage those emotions. I'm kind of like their unofficial therapist for the day. So, <laughs> um, you know, you really need to be the kind of person who, A, likes people, and B, can relate to people in all different types of situations. So I think that's why I like the chaos of the job is because I like helping people get through these crazy situations and I'm very honest about it with them. So uh, I give them a little bit of tough love on their wedding day because that's what they need. Yeah, and it was interesting. You were you were talking, and I, I was thinking about your your skill set, so to speak, and what you said about you being a therapist. And that's almost half of what they pay you for, I would feel like, because if nothing else, you're there to listen. You know, and mm -hmm. I, I feel like for a lot of, of brides and maybe ha, have you ever done any work with grooms like the wedding ringer that movie? <laughs> yeah, that's such a fun movie. Uh, yeah. You know, I, I say that I am the on call therapist because sometimes I, I do couples therapy, too, unofficially. You know, I don't have a, a, a degree by any means to do this. But, you know, there are some times when the bride will put the groom on the phone and we'll talk through things. So, you know, it is called Bridesmaid for Hire, but it's not just dealing with the bride. It's, it's really dealing with anybody who needs help to just get through the whole wedding process. Yeah, I think I think that's. I, I wish we would have hired you just to manage our whole wedding because that was stressful enough. But besides the point, let, since we are dealing with a, a podcast here about breakups and exes specifically, hey, do you have any stories relating to exes and the weddings you've been at? Ooh, um, <laughs> that's a great question. Um you know, I've never been at a wedding where they invited their exes or anything like that. But, um, you know, there's definitely been brides I, I've worked with or even, you know, friends of mine who um, had problems letting go of an ex before they got married and, and really had to have a talk with themselves and with that person to cut them out of their lives. I, I think that, um, you know, when we fall in love with someone and, and we lose them, whether it's to a breakup or just we go our own ways, Sometimes that love doesn't disappear so quickly just because we're getting married. So, um, you know, I remember I, I had a, a friend getting married and uh, she had a big, you know, a big uh, trouble trying to say goodbye to the ex and, and realizing that marrying someone else really meant it was over. So uh, I, I think that before you do tie the knot with somebody, you really need to to make amends with yourself and that old person to, to really try to let that love go or be stored away somewhere else. Yeah, and so if you're listening, um, Jen, she runs a bridesmaid for hire service, which is the most genius idea I think I've ever heard. And I don't know if you ripped that off of 27 Dresses, but I did read like a little of the background. It looks like you put like a Craigslist ad up 
and that's how it kind of just like gave you the idea or it kind of proof of concept yeah, you know, so in the movie 27 Dresses, she's a bridesmaid just for her friends. Right, and, right. Uh, you know, that was my early 20s. And, uh, you know, after my roommate nicknamed me the professional bridesmaid, that's when I said to myself, all right, you know, let me try this out. So I went to Craigslist and I posted an ad offering my <laughs> services as a, a professional bridesmaid to strangers. Uh, the ad took off, went viral, and I got hundreds of responses from brides all over the world who wanted to hire me or, or to learn more about what I was doing. Yeah, and it sort of crafted this whole business, which – so you did the ad like years ago, right? Two two or three years ago? Yeah, two and a half years ago. Two and a half years, and you've been doing the weddings pretty much ever since. Yeah, uh, after I posted the ad about you know a week later, I had the business started, and the week after that, I had booked my first client, Ashley in Minnesota, uh, and from there, it's been just a steady stream of, of working with brides and maid of honors. And that's great, but I imagine, so so it's all is it all over the world, or is it just United States based? So right now, I've only worked weddings in this country. You know, I definitely hope to make it abroad sometime soon. I do have sometimes international clients who come here and get married. Uh, but yeah, right now, it's just been a lot of travel around our own country. Well, that's cool. I mean, you get to see a lot of places, uh, barring the Nevada dropping <laughs> issue there. <laughs> but Oh, yeah. But I imagine... Now, I, I'm trying to shift this into, you said I could embarrass you at the beginning of the show, and now yeah. I'm going to try to do that. So I imagine dating for you is a little bit difficult. It is impossible. Uh, mm. You know, even even before I, I started this business, it was hard because I was very career driven. And, uh, you know, I, I, I actually I spent a lot of time dating guys who were who were opposite of me. So I used to really like guys who didn't have careers, didn't have a drive. And mm. I couldn't figure out why that was. And I think it was because I was always trying to overcompensate for them. You know, I was working two jobs at once dating guys who were working zero jobs and you know, I was dating just the wrong people and uh, then when I started this business dating became really hard because when guys found out I was a professional bridesmaid all they wanted to know was how big of a rush I was in to get married uh -huh. uh, which isn't the case at all you know I never wanted to rush into marriage well maybe so. you, maybe you could look at it like you're you're weeding out the losers you know the losers yeah. would be the guys who think that oh my god yeah and um you know, my, my personal story of where I am now is that uh, in February, I um, decided to get over somebody that I was I was really I really liked a lot. I uh, was dating somebody who lived in another country and really liked him a lot. And, uh, you know, he he pretty much broke my heart pretty badly. And I, I couldn't recover from that. I was crushed. Uh, and February came around and I had a moment where I just I woke up and I said to myself enough like I, I can't feel sorry for myself anymore. I'm 28. I need to move on. So in February, I did an experiment where I went on 14 first dates. Mm. Uh, that was my goal was to, to, to meet 14 different guys in February. And I did. I went on those dates. I met nobody, of course, that I liked. Um, but it did help me get over this person. And uh, actually, I, I went on a 15th date. And that 15th date turned out to be my boyfriend of nine months. So Awesome. Um, Congratulations. Thank you. You know what? Nine it months. Was just, yeah. It was a weird experiment that I had to do actually, to get over. Actually, you're not going to believe what I'm about. So you definitely came to the right place to talk about this because I specialize in breakups professionally. And yes. so they've researched like what is the best way to get over an ex? They've done so many different research because everyone knows, well, anyone who's maybe as nerdy and well-read as me knows that when you're going through a breakup, literally you are facing the signs of a withdrawal. So yeah. the same part of your brain that lights up when a drug addict or a cocaine addict is going through withdrawal, the same parts of the brain lights up when you're going through a breakup that's broken your heart and they've actually found that going on a getting a rebound is one of the best ways to move on from your ex now i'm not saying sleeping with the with the guy but getting a rebound so it seems like to me you just went on 14 rebound dates and bam 
over. Yeah, you know what? I, I wish it was that easy. Of course, dates one through four, I was like, this is miserable. I mm-hmm. want the old person back. But I mean, I, I really I really had strong feelings for this guy who had broken my heart. And, you know, he decided to, um, you know, move further away and, and all this stuff. And the last thing he said to me was, just wait around for me, Jen. You know, you're always single anyway. Uh-huh. Who cares? And I said to myself, you know what, enough. Like, I'm sick of chasing these these guys who, who do this. And um, that 14 goal was just for me to break the stigma of how awkward dating was. Uh, I wanted to be able to treat dating like I would a conversation with a friend. And when you don't go on many dates, you know, the first date is pretty terrifying. So yeah. a lot of that was just personal work of, of me getting over my fear of dating and, and starting from scratch, which is just the most terrifying thing sometimes. So I, I think we have an interesting um, thing to talk about here. These 14 dates that you went on, you set all of them minus the 15th date, which is the boyfriend now who you clearly, clearly liked. The yeah. 14 <laughs> dates, why don't you take me through them as much as you can and tell me about some of the horror stories because – it had to was it more of things they did or was it more of you're still obsessed over the other person long distance that didn't work out you know I think that I gave everyone a very fair chance I think I walked into these dates and said you know what Um, I have to meet this quota so when I was on the (laughs) dating app what I did was and this was really helpful was I said yes to everyone who asked and even I took the initiative to ask people on dates which I never would have done before but because I had to meet this number um, you know I, I was judging people less on their profile and just trying to rush them to meet me in person which was such a good idea because we can sit there all day and pick apart a profile and chat for days but what do we really learn about the person nothing so um i was messaging guys saying hey meet me for coffee on a sunday and um i didn't know anything about them or even really what they looked like when they showed up and that was really cool because a lot of the guys i I liked uh were guys that their profiles were kind of bare and uh, i wouldn't really have liked them from their picture so a lot of the people i liked when i met in person were people i didn't like online um you know there were definitely some horror stories i I went on some dates with guys that were you know super boring we talked i talked to one guy about um you know the the business model of uber for 45 minutes uh you know one guy came extremely intoxicated to a date and we had to sit (laughs) through dinner together i mean you know they were they were pretty painful most of them and some of them were great guys, guys I want to be friends with, but there was just, you know, no, no spark. connection. The chemistry wasn't there. It wasn't, and I wasn't looking to force it. You know, I was doing this exper- experiment not to find someone, but to get over myself, you know, and uh, to s- just feel good about myself again. And I didn't want to force myself to date someone I didn't really feel amazing about. So you went on 14 dates. Now, was that, you, you mentioned the quota. So the quota was hitting 14 dates. It was, yes. Okay, so you hit the 14 dates. How long did that take? So it took exactly um, 28 days of February. I was going <laughs> on four dates a day, sometimes on the weekends. Wow, wow. That's a lot of dating in one day. <laughs> so, it is. All right, so 14. Now, it's the 15th date, so that I guess the 15th time is the charm for you. So date number 15, how long was that? How far away from the quota was it? Was it like like it just happened like date number 14 and then a day later date number 15 or was there kind of a brief period where you you kind of laid back a little bit yeah so after the 14 dates after february i said to myself okay i'm good i gave this a shot you know i feel better about where i am with myself and and this ex and uh um i'm gonna delete my app so uh you know i think like the second week of march i said to myself okay let me go on and delete them and as i went on to delete my dating app i saw a message from a guy who was expiring in four hours and we didn't have a chance to talk but he said you know you seem interesting here's my number text me if you want and I was like text you like and you know I was thinking to myself why would I ever text a guy like that's so (laughs) not me um and you know as I went to delete the app permanently I said okay whatever you know what's one more date like it'll be weird for me to text this person it's not who I am so why not just try it so I texted this guy I said listen if you want to meet me, you can meet me for coffee at 12 o'clock on Sunday at this spot. And the guy was like, 
okay, Jen, like, calm down, I'll meet you. Uh, so on the 19th of March, uh, we, we met for coffee. And the first 30 minutes of the date, I remember being just like so uptight. And, you know, I treated it like date 15, you know, like it was nothing. And uh, about 30 minutes in, I, I realized, wow, this this guy is, is, is really cool and different. And I, I remember I sat up straight and I said to myself, pull it together and save this Jen because, you know, you're not doing so well right now. So, <laughs> um, you know, I, I think I knew 30 minutes in that there was something really interesting about the person I was sitting across. And I hadn't felt that way uh, the whole month of February. Yeah. So date number 15 what does this guy who's now your boyfriend do to make you have that epiphany where, wow, this guy's different than the rest? What were some of the things that he did? You know, he, he walked into that coffee shop. It was a busy coffee shop. I had already gotten there first. I was sitting down. I changed the time on him like three times. Uh, and he, he walked in and, and he just, you know, made me feel like I was the only person in that coffee shop. He greeted me just so excited to be there and such you know so much energy and I'm used to going on a date where we both hug awkwardly we're both shy at first and you know this guy lit up the room and uh had such a big personality and uh you know we were talking about everything from how we want to go on the amazing race together to how we're both entrepreneurs and uh you know he seemed serious about life but also really you know laid back and fun about just life and and, and you know his own personal life and um he laughed at my jokes, which was always really nice to have happen. Um, you know, it, it, I, I really can't say it was all these, you know, amazing things at, at once. It, and it wasn't just fireworks either. It was kind of just a feeling of, of calm and, you know, a feeling of comfort, which I had never in my life experienced with anybody. Usually I, I go after the guys I have fireworks for, you know, the ones who make me just go crazy because I like them so much. And there's always like a little bit of a chase and a game. And, and with this guy, it was like, the first date, you know, after it ended, he said, I'd love to take you out for pizza. And he made plans for the second date. It was just, it was just comfortable and cozy in a way, weird way. Well, it seems like it's worked out. You've been dating for nine months and things I'm assuming are going pretty well. They are. Um, you know, it's it's been incredible. I wake up every day and I, I say to myself, uh, what would have happened if I kept on chasing that, that wrong person in January, you know, uh, everything happens for a reason. Like it's been, a, it's been just a year of chasing somebody wrong and dating someone right. And I am so grateful that that wrong person left my life and, and broke my heart. If I ever see him again, which I hope I do, I want to hug him and say, thank you so much for doing what you did to me because it forced me to move on and meet the right person. Yeah. And I'm really glad you brought this up because one of the biggest issues that I struggle with with my listeners and my audience is the fact that a lot of them come to my website wanting to get their ex back. So they've gone yeah. through a really horrible breakup. They want to get their ex back. And sometimes that's not the best thing for them. And I've actually found using my own research methods that one of the best ways to actually get your ex back is to actually try to move on. It's one yeah. of the most effective ways. But it seems to me you had a breakup and you, you mentioned that your heart was broken. So what ultimately came to the decision to where you were saying, you know what, I'm going to try to get over this person as opposed to I'm going to try to get this person back. Not saying that you wanted him back, but what ultimately went into that decision? I was embarrassed by myself and for myself, you know, because um, it, it was the kind of relationship where I was constantly begging him to come visit me and to talk to me and to be with me and why I was so great. And I just kept feeling embarrassed for myself. And uh, I remember, you know, it was um, we I was taking a trip with my friends, a road trip, and I sat in the back seat of the car just saying to myself, like, you're you've become so sad and you've become, you know, all these things that aren't you. And what's the reason why this person, you know, it was all because of how this person was making me feel. And I think, you know, what happens to people is that one day you wake up, you literally wake up and you say to yourself, I've had enough. I've had enough of acting like this. And I've had enough of being sad and feeling sorry for myself. And I don't think until you have that moment, you can move on. But I think when you have that moment and you suddenly wake up and say, what the heck am I chasing? You know, and why do I think this is the best I'm ever going to get? 
um, until you've had that moment, it's, it's very hard. But when you do have that moment, you know, you wake up with a, with a reason to power through and, and try again. And every time you try again, uh, you find yourself in a better situation. I, I really do believe that's the truth. Yeah, I'm really glad things worked out for you. Um, because it seems like a lot of people can take hope from this, that even if you decide, or even if you fail to get your ex back, you can have a happy ending. And it seems to me that you're really grateful for that particular breakup. I am. And, you know, I, I've been the girl who tried to get their ex back and I was successful with that with, you know, many, many times. And let me tell you what happened is you get them back and you're in a vicious cycle of, of realizing, mm. oh, again, wow, this, this is why it ended. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I don't think relationships should be the kind of relationships that, that hurt your heart. And a lot of relationships are like that. You know, any relationship I've ever had actually with, with the guy was me feeling heartbroken most of the time or me chasing something most of the time. And, um, you know, for the first time, really, I'm in something where it's very calm and we're both on the same page. And I've never had that before, which is weird because usually I'm starting drama or I'm, you know, jealous or I don't trust a person. But those are not things you're supposed to have or want. And uh, I think you have to date a, a lot of wrong people to realize that what you're doing, your behavior is just not, not love. It's not real. Okay. So real quickly, let's talk about the happy ending here, specifically your new boyfriend. Now yeah. <laughs> I'm assuming he knows what you do. I mean, being with you nine months, he has to know you are the bridesmaid for hire girl. Oh, he knows. I mean, even before our first date, he admits now that he uh, did a lot of research on mm. me and watched so a lot of videos. It's the age we live on, you know? <laughs> yeah. It's like so, that uh, yeah. How I Met Your Mother episode. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, he knew going into it what he was getting himself into, and um, he's been extremely supportive of, of what I do and doesn't think by any means that I'm, you know, wedding obsessed or crazy. So do you ever bring him along when you go to these weddings across the state or is this kind of a your gig or he's too busy doing his thing? Yeah, so uh, there's been a couple weddings where he's traveled with me and uh, maybe crashed the end of the wedding, but uh, <laughs> I've never had, he's never, you know, actually been invited, but, um, you know, he's very supportive and he'll sometimes, you know, take the, the vacation with me to, to go to the weddings, which is a lot of fun, um, but you know, it's great having somebody who supports what you do. I'm used to having people or, or dating people who tell me that it's, you know, it's a waste of time to start a business or I'm not good enough or smart enough or strong enough. So uh, it's it's nice having someone who reminds you that you are enough. Yeah, yeah. It has to be a huge support system to fall back on when you're having that bad day. You can kind of just come and get the support you need to, to inspire you, I guess, to, to go on the next day. It's true. And you know what? I, I can't say it's all butterflies and rainbows. You know, there's there's times when uh, even my boyfriend now will give me advice that I'm too stubborn to accept and I'll fight back on. But um, it's still nice having someone to, to talk to whether or not you agree with what they say. It's just nice to have someone to vent to and get perspective. And I'm assuming... There's been no talk of marriage here because it seems to me you're so closely tied to marriage. Have you guys worked out exactly? I know this is like the most horrible question to ask, especially no. coming from a stranger. Have you guys worked out like if you are like open to that kind of a thing? Yeah, we've definitely talked about it. Um, you know, I, I think shockingly I'm the one who wants like a tiny wedding and I think he would want a bigger wedding which is mm. funny because usually it's switched right. but um you know I I've been to so many that I I don't want the traditional thing and uh I don't have the money to spend on a wedding like that so I think my idea of a wedding doesn't feel like a wedding at all uh which I think no guy expects to hear from from a, a girl especially someone in the wedding industry yeah, I remember my my wife on our wedding. Uh, she knows I'm not exactly. I, I I think I fall in line with you. I'm not really into the big extravagant weddings, and so I'm sure she would have loved to have that. But she knew that about me, and so she was the one to suggest like a small wedding, which is it's interesting that she made that sacrifice. But even with the small wedding, there was still a drama I, I think it just goes along with weddings I agree I, I think so and um, you know I, I think when 
if you want to have a wedding the right way, what you have to do is take a step back and, and ditch everything you've seen or heard about weddings and plan a party, you know, plan the coolest party you can for <laughs> the least amount of money and call it a night. Don't blow your budget. Don't go crazy planning a day for eight hours that costs more than, you know, your own car or your mortgage payments or anything like that. I think uh, keep it personal and, and plan the party of a lifetime, not a wedding, not a traditional wedding. Yeah, yeah, sage advice, especially from you. Who, you've probably been to more weddings than anyone in the world. So, oh, yeah. So I, I guess another really good segue here is to talk about your upcoming book. So you've got... Why don't I'll just give you the floor? Go ahead. Sure. So, uh, my new book, Always a Bridesmaid for Hire, hits shelves February 7th, available for pre order now. But, uh, you know, I wrote that book because a lot of times people were asking me, you know, what's your wedding horror stories? What's yeah. the worst thing that's happened to you? But, um, you know, more than that, I wanted to share with people the things I learned from brides I worked with. Uh, you know, a lot of these weddings I worked, even if they were, you know, horror stories or really sweet, I learned a lot of life lessons from, you know, getting off a plane, putting on a dress and being a bridesmaid for strangers. And, uh, you know, half of the book talks about my personal love life and some of the crazy things I I've done to find love. I went to a matchmaker. I went to get my eggs frozen. Um, my mom, she she went on my dating account for me and set up dates for me. And um, <laughs> you know, it, it really just shows like what I learned from people who are getting married and what I learned from my own love life, which has been just a chaotic mess <laughs> of all it sorts. Seems like you kind of got it figured out now, though. Yeah, you know, fast forward a couple of years and, uh, you know, once you've you've done it all and you've tried it all, maybe you meet someone, but, um, you know, it, it hasn't been it hasn't been so easy before now. So the book's called Always a Bridesmaid for Hire, right? Yes. And I'm going to actually, in the show notes of this episode, put a link to it. So if you want to pre-order that book, you can click on the link in the show notes and you will be able to pre-order it. Now, Jen, where can people find you? People can find me uh, on bridesmaidforhire.com. Uh, I'm on Instagram and Twitter at, at Jen Glantz. That's G L A N T Z. Uh, and if they have any questions, yeah, people can definitely email me at jenglantz at gmail.com. Yeah, yeah. That's and, and I wanted to also mention that you are a writer for Elite Daily. At least that's how we got connected. I think you quoted me or my wife in one of, the, one of your articles and you a lot of great work there. So people can read Thank your articles you. through there and um, trying to think of, of what else I can promote for you because you, you were so kind to come on to the show. Um, she also has a blog called Things I Learned, which is amazing. So I guess before we go, why don't you talk a little bit about your blog? Sure. So I started The Things I Learned From uh, about six years ago now as just a home to write about anything and everything going on in my life very openly and honestly. So back in the day, it was, you know, struggling to find a job, moving out of my parents' house, uh, dating, getting rejected. And I keep that up even now, writing about just personal matters happening. And my goal of the blog is just to relate to people, letting people know that no matter what you're going through, you're not alone. And, you know, I just hope these stories inspire people and let people know that, they should never, ever, ever give up because uh, there's so much to live for and uh, there's so much to, to work toward, too. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on the show, Jen. Thank you so much for having me, Chris. This was so much fun. Yeah, it was. <laughs>